Right, good morning. Good morning, excellent. We have sound as well as vision. And how are you? Good, good. That's, that's the bit where you say something, yeah? So let's try that one again. How are you? Good, yeah. Okay, we've got some really positive stuff. I'm going to see if I can not make that go down. Let's make it go up a little bit. Right, so I've been given the stage um, to uh, talk about um, six impossible things. Um, so Hardy originally contacted me and he said, Kevin, would you like to do a keynote um, at Kotlikonf? That's a good start in Amsterdam. That's a, should have opened with that. Um, and I said, yes, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a Kotlin guy. You know, I'm a Kotlin tourist at best. You know, it's just, uh, and he said, that's fine. Don't talk about Kotlin. I don't want you to talk about Kotlin. It's like, well, that's easy. But I am going to include some code in this one. Uh, I'm going to include some Kotlin, I'm going to include some C, and I'm going to include, what else am I going to include? Java. Yeah, there we go. Um, and I'm going to include some physics, I'm going to include some maths, and definitely it's going to be maths because I'm from the UK. If you want math, you'll have to go to another session. Um, so I will introduce myself as I go, but I've got a bunch of social details here. Um, and. Again, I've just been offering this advice to uh, my sister's, no, no, get, get the family relationships right, no, my niece by another route, um, who's just about to have a baby, and I did tell her, in terms of names, internet unique. Google your child's name first and last when, before you give them the name. They will thank you for it if you get it right, okay? My parents did this before the internet was invented, so good anticipation on their part, but I did do it for both of my kids and their names are internet unique. So my name's Kevin Henney. Um, they let me out of the UK and gracefully let me into um, uh, uh, France uh, yesterday so I could actually get through here, which was nice. Um, um, so that turns out not to be impossible. But what I am gonna talk about is six things that genuinely are impossible. I've taken six impossible things um, from uh, Alice in Wonderland, or through the looking glass and what Alice found there, um, by Lewis Carroll. And it is where the white, white Queen says, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Well, hopefully you've just had breakfast, and I want to look at six things that are impossible in software development. And let's be very clear, I'm not saying, oh, that's a bit hard. That's, this is not six things that are quite tricky. This is not six things that are difficult. This is not six things that our generation will not solve, but a future generation will solve. These are six things that are impossible. So when I say impossible, I mean impossible. Okay? Sometimes people struggle with the meaning of words. So I'm going to start with number six. Representations can be infinite. Okay, so I'm going to count down. Now, there's a thing about infinity. It's one of those things that kids kind of learn very quickly. They, they sort of say, well, you know, what's the biggest number you can think of? Okay, and then they, 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 they say a number. And then you just add one to it. And then they say, well, are their number's bigger than that. You add another one. This is how you teach proof by induction to children. It's the gateway drug to the rest of mathematics. And eventually they learn the idea of infinity and forever and things like that. And then they try and do an infinity plus one. And that totally is not how this works. Because infinity is not a real thing. It is mathematics. Mathematics is not real. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out, I'm definitely gonna come out as a guy who did a physics degree, not a maths degree. Um, sometimes people think maths is more fundamental than physics. Oh, you sweet kids. <laughs> it totally isn't. <laughs> physics is the thing that is real. Math we know mathematics is not real because it describes all kinds of stuff. Just like English is not somehow more fundamental than reality, because I can talk about unicorns. Most of the stuff in maths is utterly irrelevant and describes things that do not or cannot exist. One of the things we know is that the universe does not have infinities. Whenever you hear somebody say, oh, but the, the density at the heart of a black hole, the si density of the singularity is infinite, if you actually talk to a physicist, they'll say, yeah, that's where the theory breaks down. 
When you find infinity in physics, it means it doesn't work. It doesn't mean, ooh, there's something weird going on. It means we've just run out of knowledge. So, yeah, you might say, but sure, Kevin, I can represent infinity in my code. Uh, yes, but you are not actually containing infinity, are you? You're just giving it a name in the way that I just used the word infinity. It's just like when you use the word million. When you write down million, you are using seven letters. If you're doing it in digits, you're using seven digits. You're not actually using a million things any more than the word infinity means that you're actually dealing with an infinite number of stuff. Or that in IEEE 754, that I can use 32 or 64 bits to represent infinity. That's not infinite. It's just like, oh, we have no other way of describing this. Give it a name. We can go negative on it, but we can't actually contain the infiniteness of stuff. So um, a number of years ago, I edited a book, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, which um, was uh, a number of people contributed to this. And it was an open call for contribution. Uh, we managed to get 73 people um, to contribute different pieces. Now, pretty much, it was a case of people just submitted what they wanted. And there are a few people that I approached and said, it'd be great if you could mit submit something. What do you want, Kevlin? I don't know, just a thing you think every programmer should know. Except for one. Except for one person who I approached very specifically, with a title, no less. I approached Chuck Allison with this title, because he'd just written a series in Better Software magazine on IEEE 754 representation. And I thought, who better to do something on floating point numbers? Floating point numbers aren't real. That's the thing that we want to be very clear about. In fact, Chuck has this lovely description. Real numbers have infinite precision and are therefore continuous and non-lossy. Floating point numbers have limited precision, so they are finite and they resemble badly behaved integers. That is the best description of floating point numbers I have ever heard. Please feel free to take that back to the office. How badly, but the thing is, it turns out that integers are quite badly behaved as well when we put them on computers. So this is a piece of code from the Java libraries, written by Josh Block in the late 90s. Um, it's a binary search. And um, it clearly makes use of integers. And yeah, it's all good. And it's actually based on an algorithm for doing so um, that comes from John Bentley, who was, in fact, um, uh, I think, professor um, when Josh Block was studying data structures and algorithms. So this algorithm was created in 1983. And you can see the same three-way partitioning there. In fact, one of the key points that John Bentley made with this algorithm was that he proved that it was correct. I kind of think there's a, you notice here the notation in the curlies must be, there's a kind of foreshadowing of the use of should be and stuff like that um, in, the, in the early 80s. But these are basically assertions. These are invariants. These are things that must be true. And he proved this to be correct. Um, and his whole shtick on uh, program verification. One of the major benefits of program verification is it gives programmers a language in which they can express that understanding. Uh, that's such a profound piece of optimism. For anybody who lived through the verification era, it was one of many false statements that was made. <laughs> Provably false now. These techniques are only a small part of writing correct programs. Keeping the code simple is usually, usually the key to correctness. OK, definitely. We're, I'm, on, I'm on board with that bit. But the next bit, I think, is brilliant. <laughs> On the other hand, several professional programmers familiar with these techniques have related to me an experience that is too common in my own programming. When they construct a program, the hard parts work the first time, while the bugs are in the easy parts. Now, this is true not just of program verification. This is true of that thing we call programming. You've undoubtedly experienced this. You put so much effort into the bit you knew was hard, and there's, a, there's something you incorrectly initialized, forgot to change, and off by one. There's all kinds of stuff, and it's just like the easy stuff that falls over. However, the point that I want to get to here is that this, if you are interested in fiction, in writing, in drama, in films, this is what is called foreshadowing. Because it turns out that in this code, there is a bug. It turns out this is fine for the kind of data that we experienced in the 1980s, and in fact, even in the 1990s. We had 32-bit programming, but you couldn't address anything with 32 bits. Good heavens, that was like gigabytes. 
People didn't even know what gigabytes were back in the 1980s. In fact, they didn't even know what Giga was. If you actually watch Back to the Future, Doc Brown pronounces it Jigga. It was such an unfamiliar word. So the point there is that you simply could not use 32-bit addressing to actually address 32 bits worth of memory. These days, we look at that and go like, well, that's nothing. Yeah? It's like when my kids were younger, when I was teaching them about, because obviously this is the useful education you give your kids, even teaching them about kind of like memory sizes and things like that. I mean, don't you have that conversation, or is it just, okay. Um, and I got down to one kilobyte, and my older son said, well, what's even the point of that, Dad? He's like, why, why even have a name for it? And I said, old man, yeah, my first computer had one kilobyte of memory. You know, and he's just looking at me like, you are just making stuff up. <laughs> but the problem here, is there is a bug when you give very large arrays to this. It turns out that the bug is in this line. This line is trying to find the midpoint, but this is not how you... Now, this is, this is the problem between, you know, when you're doing a binary search, you're binary chopping, you're finding the midpoint of things. What this technically does is it finds the mean. The midpoint and the mean are kind of almost the same, but not quite. This is how you find the midpoint. This one works. Because you see in this one, if low and high are rather large, then you take two very large numbers, you add them together, you get a very large negative number. Oops. Yeah? Does not work. This, however, to find the midpoint, you find the distance, you divide by two, then you add it to the lower thing. That's technically a different construct. Mathematically, these are equivalent, but it's just a reminder, this is, pro this is code, this is programming, it's not maths. So here we see the assumption was right in there. He didn't notice. That's the thing about assumptions. Assumptions are a little bit like that. They are like stepping on Lego bricks in a dark room with bare feet. Even if you know you have assumptions, you don't know where they are until you've stepped on them. Assumptions are invisible knowledge to us. Assumptions are things that you normally only discover by contradiction. In other words, you know you had an assumption when it's wrong. Up until that point, you didn't know you had an assumption. Oh, I had assumed that. At that moment, you've discovered something. It's the nature of knowledge. It's also the nature of irony that the article it appeared in was called Writing Correct Programs. Um, as I said, foreshadowing. Now, that was written in 1983. The bug was discovered in 2006. But local boy, Eska Dijkstra, did kind of point this out in 1969. Then about, I have assumed perfect arithmetic. Quotes, in my experience, the validity of such proofs often gets questioned by people who argue that in practice one never has perfect arithmetic at one's disposal. Admissible integer values usually have an absolute upper bound. Real numbers are only represented to a finite accuracy, etc. So what is the validity of such proofs, he said, anticipating by nearly a decade and a half John Bentley's error. If one proves the correctness of a program assuming an idealized perfect world, one should not be amazed if something goes wrong when this ideal program gets executed by an imperfect implementation. So that moves us onto another thing. The point is that we know that things can't be infinite, and yet in our heads we forget about this. It's why we call these, it's why I always quite like the abbreviation int, not integer, because they're not integers, they're ints, they're abbreviated. Every question has an answer. Now, there are a couple of ways that this plays out. So, um, this is one I've been using for some time. Actually, as you can see, quite a lot of time. So, I submitted this kind of uh, bug report to Facebook back when they were totally destroying democracy. Um, and what I've discovered is that although they said your feedback will be used to improve Facebook, this is a false statement. Um, thanks for taking the time. It turns out quite a lot of time. But you look at that and you go, 31st of December 1969, that is suspiciously close to the beginning of time. In fact, it predates it. It is before the Big Bang. Okay, you're looking at that. You know, I triple the time function shall return the value of time in seconds since the epoch. Okay, and we know what that value is. If you didn't know that the beginning of time was the 1st of January 1970, just wait around. There's a few errors that will direct you towards this one. I love this one. Option updates, this is from Intel. Intel were obviously, you know, installing updates via the internet on the 1st of January 1970. At 
the stroke of midnight as it became 1970. I suspect they weren't really doing this, and this was just the oops, something got set to zero. Yeah, so time at zero. It turns out that time at zero is a, or any value at zero is surprisingly convenient. Martin Fowler tweeted this one at me last year. You ought to know that United may have discovered a kink in the time-space continuum of the Atlantic. Sadly, they weren't have, uh, able to take advantage of this. Turns out time to destination is zero, that wonderful value of default initialization. Um, and so I, I initially thought, with that Facebook thing, when I screenshot it, I initially thought it's a zero problem. It's a zero initialization problem. And what's happened is a time zone shift. Because I'm in the UK, and granted, the UK has been stepping gradually backwards in time over the last few years. I think we're currently in the 1950s. Um, but I thought, maybe it's a time zone shift, because the US is negative time from the UK. So therefore, we got zero, and then we shifted back into 1969. But actually, there is a more plausible explanation for this that I've come to believe is the true explanation. And that's because the universe is built in C. OK? If you, if you doubt me, one, you're wrong, because I just told you the beginning of time, and you took that at face value. And you said, yep, that is the beginning of time. I quite like also the fact that that as the beginning of time means that I am effectively immortal, because I suspect I'm hoping to live beyond the year 2038 problem. That means I will have existed before and after time, which, is kind of, which would be kind of nice to, you know, uh, to call. But the other thing is that C, C is the language that got everybody counting from zero. You start from nothing, okay? just as the universe allegedly did. So there we go. So C is the stuff of the universe, right at the bottom. And when we look at time, time is not always available. Minus one is returned if the calendar time is not available. What's the time? Does not always have a good answer. It's not available. And people think that time is just a thing that you can ask a question of. It's like a property or something like that. It is not a property. Time, I'm going to borrow from uh, Anne Hathaway's character, Dr. Amelia Brand from Interstellar. She, she puts it quite appropriately. We need to think of time as a resource. And what do we know about resources? They are not always available. You may not have experienced a failure of time, although I experience that every day. You may not have experienced the fact that time is not returned, but time is an operating system service. There is no guarantee any of that stuff ever works 100% of the time. It is quite possible with a large enough system, you will end up with a minus one coming in somewhere. Now, of course, we don't just use, you shouldn't just use the domain available to you, minus one. You, know, you shouldn't really be returning that as an integer, but you know, this is C. And you might say, well, yeah, Kevin, we've got other ways of doing that. The ever popular NAN. Lufthansa's great insight telling me that NAN, I tried to parse it, but it's not a number. Yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> now, as we enter an age where, and we were well into the age where we are dealing with software everywhere, this stuff runs the universe now, it runs our world, it's going to run cars. The amount of the amount of software in a modern car is quite frightening, actually. Um, and, and for anybody who's a hobbyist who loves old cars, I understand where you're coming from. They have zero lines of software. Okay, you know what you're doing with them. But as we move towards driverless cars, we should... There we go. This happened in 2020. During the initialization lap, something happened which apparently caused the steering control signal to go to NAN, and subsequently the steering locked to the maximum value to the right. I just want to say, please, please test your code. OK? Just a, just a mild suggestion. But we also see this. Do you, you have this? I get this a lot. I go to an app, and it's just like, you have no stuff. Oh, here's your stuff. There's a moment where my heart leaps, where it's just like, shit, what have you done with my money, my books, my whatevers? We have a name for this. It's called bad programming. OK, let me get into that. I don't want to dismiss stuff as bad without offering you what's going on. It's a failure to appreciate the nature of stuff, the fact that answers are not always available. We don't have an answer to the question, how much stuff do I have? Yet, yeah, that answer is not zero. 
It is, this stuff is not available. But somebody decided, in whatever language they chose, that also, you know, oh, yeah, we did this with monads. Yeah, still says zero. You got that wrong. It, does, it turns out that there is a thing going on here. This, as John Carmack noted, large fraction of the flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding all the possible states their code may be in. A simple yet profound observation. So here is what's going on. So I, I, I found that with um, a lot of people don't understand the state of their code and often don't have a notation or way of diagramming it or thinking about it. They are looking at the code as it is. Code is very expressive, but it is constrained in the paradigm and style of delivery that it's got. And most mainstream languages don't even come close to having rich state models, um, which is slightly worrying given that a lot of stuff is UI based and that is obviously very stateful. So what's happening in the code as it was is we went into displayable mode with a value of zero. And then the value was loaded and it became three, an event that caused us to update the value. It's just like, no, that's not the right model. What you have is, is you have an initial state loading where you don't display stuff, or you don't display the value. And then it becomes displayable once it's loaded. It's not displayable initially. That's just, that's just not good. So I don't know what happened between the 1990s where we didn't get this wrong as much. I remember spending a lot of time on this, trying to make sure that this worked for an application on the network, that we actually got this right, um, rather than giving people, hey, you've got no stuff. Um, but here's the simple solution. That's what you do. We say there is not currently an answer available. You step outside the domain of representation to say, I'm making a conscious choice here. I'm expressing a state. And I'm not going to confuse you. But, and the point made in 97 things by a nice piece by Nicholas Nielsen, thinking in states. In most real world situations, people's relaxed attitude to state is not an issue. Unfortunately, however, many programs are quite vague about state too, and that is a problem. I found with one, con uh, with one client before the pandemic, every time I visited them, there was a very good chance that I would look at their code and then go to the whiteboard and say, let's understand the states here. And that would normally be the, enough to show the problem. Oh, yeah, we've got two states here. Yeah, you've got a lot of flags. A lot of flags. I think you've got more than two things going on. Yeah? And I'm also, I'm also that awkward guy who will quite happily um, Make people uh, nervous. So, 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 make people nervous in a lift. What do I mean by that? So, there was a hotel in Bangalore um, that I visited a number of years ago, and there was a bug in the lift, the software for the lift, and I was able to recreate it every time. And it was to do with the fact that if you pressed a particular button whilst it had already got its route plotted in, it would ignore the state and send you to the ground floor. And we went back, I went back for a workshop there about five years later, and I was with a couple of other people. I said, oh, just let me see if there's a bug. Is that bug still here? Yes, it is. And they're kind of standing there going like, I don't know how safe I feel with you, Kevlin, at this point. I have also did that in my car a while back. There was this really interesting bug um, with, the, uh, with, with the engine um, uh, with the engine uh, code that actually interacted rather poorly with the light systems, and the engine management system should be independent from the lights. And uh, yeah, it caused a, a, a deceleration that you could only reset by tapping on the accelerator button. And I remember sitting in the car with another software uh, guy, and the two of us sitting there exploring all the possibilities as we were driving down the motorway. You don't do that with normal people. It, let me just tell you, it scares them. <laughs> so yeah, think in states. I also want to cover when I'm saying that that fallacy, the fallacy that every question has an answer. I'm not simply saying sometimes you need to reframe the range that you're the codomain, that you need to expand it and say, oh, well, let's answer a different question or let's expand the possibilities to acknowledge that this is not available, that there is an answer outside yes and no that there is an answer outside the normal co-domain of representation. I'm also saying that sometimes we cannot even achieve an answer at all. And this is the nature of stuff. This is the logic stuff. This is, by the way, a really good graphic novel. It's about a lot of this stuff that was going on in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, and it's kind of framed around a, an autobiography, or a biography, sorry, of, um, 
uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, it breaks the fourth wall. It's a really good graphic novel. And they make a, a point about a number of things. And they offer us a nice definition of algorithm. A method, uh, a methodical step-by-step -step procedure described in terms of totally unambiguous instructions which starts at a specified initial condition and eventually terminates with the desired outcome. Okay. If you ever need to kind of, if you ever have one of those family conversations, oh, artificial intelligence, all those algorithms, hey, there is nothing wrong with algorithms. It's data that's the problem. It's not, those algorithms are just fine. It's the data. I mean, honestly, if you gave me a function that took one billion parameters, I'd be a little suspicious. I wouldn't say this is good programming practice. Oh, we know what the algorithm does. Yeah, but what are those parameters? What, the billion parameters we don't have names for? Honestly, who knows? But the algorithm's great. So um, let's demonstrate algorithms. And this is where it gets interesting, because you see, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago exploring playfully esoteric sorting algorithms. Algorithms that are essentially not safe for work but are great fun, because they teach you something either about computer science, about programming, or about requirements. And one of the ones I looked at was permutation sort. I love permutation sort. It has factorial complexity, which is totally OMG. Okay? In essence, it is an unoptimized search for the permutations of the input values until it finds the one arrangement that is sorted. Yeah. Why would I ever do this? Well, this is a really simple, uh, what, what use is this algorithm? One, it's fun. Two, it's provocative. If you're ever in a situation where you say, OK, so what are our performance requirements for this? Oh, we have no performance requirements. You just drop permutation sort right in there. <laughs> you will they will discover very quickly that they have performance requirements. <laughs> yeah? Somewhere between instantaneous and permutation sort is where their requirements are. Okay? It's a, it's a good way, it's a probe. Now, I, I wrote code for this in, I've got code for this in uh, Python, I wrote code for this in C, I wrote code for it in Groovy, and I thought, I'm going to Kotlin Conf. You know what? I ought to do this in Kotlin because, I mean, you know, that would be appropriate, right? Um, and I thought, how hard could it be? And so, the, sh the smallest implementation that I've been able to find, of all those languages I mentioned, C++ actually has the shortest um, implementation for permutation sort. Um, so I did a bit of Googling. I needed to find, okay, standard library, I'm looking for a way of generating permutations, Groovy has one. Um, so I, I, Google did not bring me much joy on this one. So I went to Twitter, where lots of people suggested how to write a bit. No, no, I'm good with that. That's fine. I want to know if there's something in the standard library. I don't want to write anything extra. OK. And then I was inspired. I was inspired uh, by Igor Brech on Twitter and something that he tried. So I thought I'd go and try it. Let's go and have a chat with ChatGPT. Hey. Does the Kotlin standard library have a way to generate permutations of a list? Yes. It provides a way to generate permutations of a list using the permutations function. Oh, cool. Here's an example usage. Nice. This will output C sharp, apparently. <laughs> mm. OK. I do just want to say, remember I said earlier on, you've got to test stuff? Yeah, yeah. So that means I'm going to end, and in fact, it's really specific. I mean, it returns a sequence, so it's lazily evaluated. I mean, it's really, this is really useful. It does not generate all the permutations once. It lazily evaluates them. It's just like, oh, this is pretty good. Excellent. So that means my algorithm is going to look something like this. I'm going to do it in the style of sorted. I'm going to write it as an extension method. It said list, so yeah, we'll stick with list. I'm not going to worry about iterables or anything like that. Let's just do this. So it's going to look something like that. And that, I need the criteria is that it's sorted, and then we return that. Otherwise, we clearly have an empty list. And yeah, that's that. OK, fine. But I need, that needs, OK, next question. Does the Kotlin standard library have a way to check if a list is sorted? Hell yeah. Awesome. And it's usage just like this. 
That's great. So basically, all I have to do now is I write that. OK, that's the imperative version. Then I can kind of make it a lot more comprehension-like and really boil it down. This is fantastic. And this is awesome. There's only one problem. There's a number of you have spotted. This is a complete hallucination. None of this stuff is real. It just made it up. So I'm also going to offer an additional suggestion. In addition to telling you to test your code, I would also urge you to compile it as well. <laughs> you know, it seems an obvious step, but apparently it's not that obvious. So, yeah. So I, I, I took the implementation I had from Python, and I, I ported it over. So let's, let's follow. ChatGPT's suggestion of you know, the style that I'm going to be doing this in. I'll do it as an extension method. And then I asked ChatGPT, could you generate me a version of, permutation, of permutations um, that I can use? The first, it did not generate this, by the way. The first version it generated didn't actually work. How do I know this? Because I tested it. You see there's a theme here. If you are using Copilot, or if you, if you plan to use Copilot or ChatGPT for anything, it's worse than Stack Overflow in one sense. OK? At least people comment on the stuff in Stack Overflow, and you get a sense, and they upvote it. It's just like, you will need more testing. Whatever, however much testing you're doing now, you will need to do more with, machine, with uh, anything that's generated. Because effectively, what we've done is, well done us as an industry. We have created a new way, new way of creating legacy code. So now we're all going to be maintenance programmers. I, that's called an own goal. Um, so anyway, I then told ChatGPT, hey, dude, this does not work. This does not actually work. Oh, sorry. Then it generated the correct version. I said, could you do it with sequences rather than with lists? And actually, it gave me something that worked. And so then I refactored it. And it was just like, yeah, and so I got this. But it was just a case of like, I had to know what I was expecting and what it should look like and have a bunch of tests. Just, just a word of caution there. So anyway, that was fixed. Nice. Which gets us to the point, because I'm trying to tell you about things that don't have answers. Surely there is nothing worse than permutation sort. Yeah. Please hold. Don't be so sure. The essence of BOGO sort is to shuffle values randomly until they are sorted. I was relieved to discover that after discovering that the Kotlin library didn't have anything that I considered to be useful from an algorithmic perspective, it did actually have a random shuffle. It's just like, oh, come on. <laughs> I want to shuffle in a known way, uh, but, and you can't give me that, but you're going to, no. OK, fine. However, this is not actually a correct implementation, because it gives an unfair advantage to sequences that are already sorted. The idea is that you repeat until sorted. So let's switch it. OK, excellent. <laughs> Now, now, we're, now, this is, now this is a real proper implementation of BOGO sort. Um, now, there is an observation from John von Neumann. Anyone who considers arithmetical methods of producing random numbers is, of course, in a state of sin, which sounds fantastic. Um, I, he says it like it's a bad thing. However, we will, we will borrow, we will take from this wisdom and, and use secure random, which should be based on a reasonable source of entropy. And now, we start asking a question. That question is, well, we, we start out talking about algorithms. But is that an algorithm? Sure, it fits this. An algorithm is a specific procedure for solving a well-defined computational problem. But there is a bit that's missing. From a computer science perspective, there's a very specific definition of algorithm. A procedure which always terminates is called an algorithm. We're not guaranteed that this will terminate. You can do a proof, of, you can do a proof by induction um, that it won't terminate. The bogo saw is not required to terminate. The proof by induction is on my blog. Um, it's just in a paragraph. It's, it's, it's verbal. So it's not actually necessarily an algorithm. So how do we test it? Um, and you know, because we do need to test it. Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. So how are we going to demonstrate that bogo saw works? apart from you know, reviewing the hell out of the code and getting a lot of confidence. Well, it turns out most of the time it runs, it's going to run in a reasonable time. In fact, you know, if I just put it here, this, 
This always terminates whenever I've run it, which if you pause for a moment, you'll realize is a stupid statement because how would I know that it had never terminated, yeah? But what we're basically saying is that you have to run, the, basically at the end of time, it will be sorted. Oh, that's our old friend, Infinity. Sadly, this doesn't work because we can't use that. So, but I've found that, you know, just a few milliseconds is enough normally to get, uh, get the answer that we want. Which, by the way, means we've actually solved the halting problem. For those of you not familiar with the halting problem, the halting problem basically says, you know, is there a way that we can determine, is there an algorithm that will determine whether or not an arbitrary piece of code will always terminate or determine whether it will terminate or not? And the answer is no, there is not a way to do this unless you add non-determinism. In other words, what I've just done, if that's why we have timeouts. You have a timeout and you say, well, there are three answers. There's yes, no, and who knows. <laughs> now, the point there is that we are also talking about knowledge here. Impossible thing number four, every truth can be established where it applies. If there is something that is true, then in that context where I need to know that truth, I can find that truth. That sounds very philosophical. And we kind of refer to Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which are coming up nearly 100 years old, actually. Um, and a lot of people think, OK, yeah, that's kind of interesting. They've heard the term, and they think that's not really applicable to me in my daily coding. Mm, we're going to find out that there are some bits here where it is. So a nice series of um, paper reviews, uh, morning papers that Adrian Collier did for a number of years, where he provided a summary of a research paper. I found this really useful, very interesting, the stuff that he was covering. And he was talking about fairness in um, uh, machine learning. Uh, but one of the side notes he made was this observation. Um, Bertram Russell and Alfred North Whitehead published Principia Mathematica in 19, 1911, a large set of proofs that is largely unread. It took them over 300 pages to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. You can tell it's not a pacey plot. Um, but there's some important stuff there. And what they wanted to do was demonstrate that, using logic, that mathematics was you know, complete and consistent. And they did so, until 20 years later, somebody found a young Austrian mathematician, Kurt Gödel, um, shattered the dream, showing that for any consistent axiomatic system, there will always be theorems that cannot be proven within the system. There are statements that are true, but are not provably true. The only way you can prove them or demonstrate any truth about them is by stepping outside the system of consideration. Um, it's the inspiration in this classic book, why Gödel was included, a lot of his, uh, the, the implications of his work, Gödel Escherbach uh, by Douglas Hofstadter, who also kind of observes general things about this. All consistent axiomatic formulations of number theory include undecidable propositions. Turns out that any system of encoding, any system of code, that's what we deal with. So how do we find something that's undecidable? Well, there's lots of examples. One of my favorite ones is but the easiest examples are just to switch to C, because it's the stuff the universe is made of. And then we're going to find out how long is a piece of string. OK? Now, for those of you who are not familiar with C, um, a few things you need to know. Um, size T is a size type. It's an unsigned quantity. Strill N is reflective of the great vowel shortage that we used to have in the 1970s. You know, the, something happened back then, but these days we have vowels and long identifiers. Strill n, the length of a string. Um, and basically we are pointing to a sequence of characters. Okay, there is a, an intimate, some would say a sinful intimacy, between pointers and arrays in C. Writing this algorithm is actually fairly straightforward. Okay, we can actually say, yeah, we start with a count of zero, we just keep on going till we hit the null character, and we increment the count, and we're done. Right. But there are some assumptions here. Remember those things? Assumptions. Yeah. What needs to be true for this to work? Well, actually, we can out our assumptions. One of the most obvious ones is that that pointer cannot be null. Excellent. I know, you can see, I, I can write that in C. And then there's another rather big assumption. You will see that this one is 
uses some logic and is not in the same color as the surrounding code, because it is not code. What this basically says is that there exists a null terminator. We don't know that there exists a null terminator. I'm not saying, oh, statistically in memory, there probably is one. I'm saying we know 100% whether or not there is one. And more importantly, that the point between here and there, everything is defined. There is no way to write this in the system of standard C. Strelen cannot prove its own precondition. That's why I said C, it's really easy to do. You can do this in other cases. Uh, it's just that C is a little more dramatic when, it come, when you get it wrong. So, for example, let's it turns out you can demonstrate the truth by stepping outside the calling context, but that's no longer the system of Strelen. We've just stepped outside it. I can see I've got a well-formed string. Okay, BX, that's got a null. It's automatically, a null is inserted at the end by the compiler. And it just says, be excellent to each other, which is great advice. And it gives you the Strelen, which is 26. Awesome. However, if I do the following, which is a little bogus and a little bit naughty, I've got a character, I've got five characters, but I don't have a null on the end. In fact, even if I use this slightly deceptive form that makes it look like there should be one, the compiler is totally cool with it. This is absolutely defined behavior. There is no guaranteed null. So what happens when we execute it? Well, if you're lucky, maybe it works. Although I'm kind of thinking maybe if you're unlucky, it works. Um, if you're not lucky, then phew, you find yourself somewhere in intergalactic space heading towards M87 from the looks of it. And then everybody's favorite. Oops, I forgot to initialize it and the compiler doesn't tell you because it's not a requirement of the language. It's what is called undefined behavior. That, who knows where S points to? It's not defined, it's not zeroed or anything like that. The compiler says it doesn't do any flow analysis on it, it's not required. Flow analysis, this is the 1970s, I'm sorry, we don't do that. What happens when you do this? <laughs> Whoa, yeah, you hit the boundaries of knowledge. So the point there is that we cannot prove what is required from the inside. Now you might be sitting there going like, well, <sighs> Kevlin, I'm sitting here in my nice warm managed language. I might be resting comfortably on the JVM. What relevance has all of this got to do with me? Well, first of all, I just chose you an easy example because C is an easy way to get to it. But there's other ways of looking at this. So back in the first wave of lockdowns, 2020, Trisha G and I finished 97 things every Java programmer should know. Same kind of principle as the uh, 97 things every programmer should know. But now for, strictly speaking, um, uh, JVM related languages and environment, uh, although obviously most of the examples are um, uh, Java, we got some Kotlin stuff, we got some Groovy stuff, we got some Clojure stuff. Apparently there are no Scala programs out there, um, but uh, I leave that to you to figure out. Um, but one of the pieces from Thomas Ronson, I quite like, how to crash your JVM. He comes up with a list of ways of yeah, eliciting undefined behavior and badness out of a managed environment. And he said, write some native code. All the syntax of C, all the safety of C. There you go. It's immediately relevant to everybody. So this has broader implications. As Adrian observes, one premise of many models of fairness in machine learning is you can measure or prove the fairness of a machine learning model from within the system, from the properties of the model itself and perhaps the data it is trained on. What we know is that this is not true. To show that a machine learning model is fair, you need information from outside the system. Now, this also has some other implications. I just referred to 2020. This was a magnificent piece of performance art by um, an artist, Simon Veckert, based in Berlin. Simon Veckert bought 99 Android phones secondhand, put them in a handcart, and wandered around the, the empty lockdown streets of Berlin, causing traffic jams. Yeah, where, where art and programming meet. So this is the point. We need to be really careful as well. Because what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that, that, that you can discover the truth where it is being applied. We use this word, term very casually, engagement. Whole marketing strategies, pricing strategies, companies are based on the idea of engagement. And yet when I look at the dictionary, leaving aside the wedding implications, the state of being engaged is engagement. 
Do your statistics measure that? I mean, most of the time when people are being presented with advertising, they are not, I'm definitely, they're not engaged. Are they emotionally involved? Do they have commitment? I don't think so. Well, you're not measuring engagement. You're measuring clicks and shares. You need to, you know, reality should always appear in quotes. It's engagement, only in quotes. It's clicks and shares. That's what you're actually measuring. Yet, it doesn't sound very good when you say that. So, William James observed, we must be careful not to confuse data with abstractions we use to analyze them. And on, honestly, we do that a lot. So here's another one, hitting the boundaries of knowledge. The future is knowable before it happens. I mean, that'd be really cool if, it were, <laughs> if, if this were not true, <laughs> if, if, or rather, if this were true, if it were not an impossibility, this would be fantastic. But this is all about knowledge. So Grace Hopper observed that programming is more than an important practical art. It is also a gigantic undertaking in the foundations of knowledge. It means we must understand the shape and nature of the knowledge that we're dealing with. And th there's a scheme that I borrowed, um, adapted from Philip Armour, the five orders of ignorance, four of which apply here, and I can reframe them. There's the known knowns, there's the known unknowns, the things that I know that I know, the things that I know that I don't know, the things I don't know that I don't know, that's where assumptions tend to live in, uh, tend to live and the things that we cannot know about until they are known. We cannot do anything in advance to find out. Okay, I can use a technique of deliberate discovery to stumble across more Lego bricks than, than, uh, uh, than others, but we tend to base all of our estimates on the first category. We're really bad at this. Occasionally, by the way, I will just say, every now and then I get somebody commenting, oh, Kevin, what about the unknown knowns, as if that's a real category? It isn't. I'll just tell you that. If you think there is a known thing that is actually, you know, if it's, the, if, it's the known, if it's the unknown knowns, that just means you've got something wrong. Um, it's, you're surprised when you discover that it was different. That is an assumption. That is the unknown unknowns. So just with these four categories, obviously the first one is the most comfortable. And we've become progressively worse at handling the, the uh, successive ones. But the unknowable unknowns are the ones of most interest here. Because that's where the future is. You cannot know what the future holds in store until you arrive at it. At which point it's too late to tell the past. Halting problem is one such example. Only when you've reached eternity can you tell whether or not uh, this one doesn't terminate. Yeah. Now, the problem is, as you know, trying to make things future-proof is remarkably difficult. <laughs> okay, so this one from Seth Rosen. When naming things like tables, always future-proof. If you sell wine, calling a table wines will be confusing when expanding to beer. Beverages will be confusing when you sell ice. Products will be confusing when expanding to services. So obviously, you need to you know, call everything stuff or table one. <laughs> I have seen this code. It's so general. But this brings me to one of my favorite observations. That's something that I've talked about for years. I've talked about it for years. It's just like, people love this. Oh, here's our company roadmap. roadmap. Here's our product roadmap. Here's our architecture roadmap. And you know, twiddling my thumbs at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, you know what, let's actually go online and just look up, because surely there must be PowerPoint templates for this stuff, because people are always using them and overusing them. And yeah, there's loads of PowerPoint templates. And most of them look like this. They use a road. Clever, I see what you've done there. And you're supposed to fill in the gaps. But you see, the problem for me is when you look at an actual roadmap, damn, you are here. Um, when you look at an actual roadmap, what you see is something else. You see possibilities. You see, that's the thing that's always bugged me. It's just like, well, you've given me a roadmap and it's only got one road. Why do I need a map? <laughs> you don't need a map if you've only got one road. You just need an itinerary. That's it. Calling it a roadmap is, is, is really rather extravagant. 
Because that's the whole point of a roadmap. You see, I would love that metaphor if people used it correctly. I think people should present roadmaps. I think that would be exciting and useful. We're thinking of going this way, but there's a possibility that, that these are alternative routes. As we approach them, we will discover that this route is slower or that route is blocked. That's the point. That we don't know the future. I mean, whoever produced this template obviously did so in 2017, 2018, because, hey, nobody else predicted. 2020, <laughs> global pandemic disrupts your business and everybody you do business with. No, did nobody have that in their project plan? Nope. You didn't know that until it arrived. So this is the problem. It also means that we need to be careful of the words that we use. I find a lot of people talk about, oh yeah, we're going to prioritize our requirements. We're going to prioritize our features in the backlog. We're going to, we're going to prioritize by business value. Because if you use the word business value, it makes it sound like you're credible and you're real and you're in touch with the business. There is no such thing as business value. I mean, it's a slight hype term. You, first of all, you need to be more precise. Business value to whom? I once saved one of our clients two weeks of work by pointing out that there was a much simpler workaround than the database solution that my boss was trying to sell them. In 30 minutes, I could code up something that just did the right thing with the file system and importantly, did not lock them into our product. I think that was a great business value, not to the company that I was working for, but to our client, absolutely. So first of all, when you say business, you need to be specific, which business? And then you need a time frame. Because you remember text messages, SMS? That was a big surprise to everybody that that was massively successful. Never underestimate the power of teenagers. But these days, there isn't really an SMS market. Phone contracts used to be sold based on how many thousands of SMS messages you could send. I remember my wife and I being slightly bewildered, going like, yeah, yeah, we're not teenagers. This is not going to happen. Thousands per month, no. But now there is no market for that. So the business value of these is quite low. Originally it was predicted to be zero, now it's closer to zero, it's close to zero, and then there was a huge big bump. You, what time frame is your business value being evaluated over? When you say business value, do you mean next week or next year? So that's the first thing. And then you have a harder problem. Even when you've got a precise definition of what you mean by business value, you still can't prioritize by it. Now let me be absolutely clear, I'm not saying you shouldn't prioritize by business value. I'm saying you can't because of the laws of physics, because you do not know what the business value of something is until you have reached the criteria, which normally involves a time frame, and you've reached the end of that, and you go, you know what? We were wrong. <laughs> that will be the most common evaluation of anybody's estimate of business value. So I just want to remind you that you should use the word estimated. I don't have a problem with people saying, Let's prioritize by estimated business value, because there's an honesty and a completeness to that statement that's difficult to deny. But if somebody then comes up to me and says, oh, but yeah, but Kevlin, you know, you're just playing with words, then we need to have a very serious conversation about the difference between estimates and actuals. Okay, oh, let's just, no, these two words, they're almost the same. No, they're really not. So, you can't prioritize by business value. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is this one, prediction is very difficult especially about the future. Now, the problem with this quote is it demonstrates the difficulty. This, uh, Niels Bohr, this is who I always thought said it, and I like that because quantum physics, it somehow plays with that. One of my co-authors preferred the interpretation that it was Yogi Berra. In fact, you can go on the internet and find out that it was probably our, uh, Abraham Lincoln. The problem is this is something in the past and we don't know it. How on earth are we going to know the future? So this question of knowability. Distributed systems. We have to deal with these a lot. And here we see some implications. Let's go back to this one. So there is something of a, a gap between Europe and North America. Um, semantic gap, a way of writing dates, which reminds us why there is an Atlantic Ocean. There's all kinds of differences. But the one I want to focus on here is 
physical separation, because that is effectively what a distributed system introduces. Physical separation. So it's nearly 6,000 K. That's not 19 centimeters. The space, space is significant. That's 19 light milliseconds. That has really important implications, especially if, especially if your boss says, you know what, we need to keep our servers in sync with our New York office, and they must never be more than 10 milliseconds out of date with one another. Oh, laws of physics, speed of light, sorry. No, 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 that's, that's just you being a can't do kind of person. I need can do people on my team. No, really, laws of physics, okay? Look, if you find a way to break the light barrier or to travel back in time, uh, uh, re the previous one, then honestly, what the hell are you doing here? I mean, you know, <laughs> you should be out checking out dinosaurs or making an absolute mint off the stock market. This separation has consequences because it's not guaranteed that things that are separated will work. The classic Leslie Lamport definition of a distributed system, one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Those frequent fires in California a couple of years ago, so my publisher discovered this one. Ah, fire in California, can't read your books, e-books in Pennsylvania. Yeah, kind of loss of location transparency. Um, but there's also some other things. Brewer's theorem, which is originally a conjecture, these days we refer to it typically as cap theorem. It was a conjecture, but it was actually proved in 2002, 2003. Quick show of hands, who's come across cap theorem? Okay, fair for you. For the rest of you, um, hey, three letters, who knew? Um, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. Um, partition to consistency, basically, whenever, a, whenever we want a data value, wherever we are in that network, Whoever asks the question, we all get an agreed upon value. It is consistent. You asking the question and me asking the question doesn't give us a different answer. If you're looking on social media and I'm looking on social media up here, we might be going via different servers. If we look, hey, did you see that post from, yes, I did, and you were agreeing on exact, we see the same thing, okay? Availability. There is always an answer to your request. There's never an error. In other words, with consistency, basically, we get the case where we might say, I can see the post, but you can't. You're, you're getting an error status, okay? Availability, you, you never get an error status. You always get a value. But it's not necessarily guaranteed to be the latest, okay? So that's caching. Partition tolerance. Your application still continues to appear to work even in the event of network partitioning, which is a polite way of saying stuff doesn't work. Your network becomes a not work, okay? A router goes down, a server goes down, whatever. The point there is you are still able to run. Your distributed application, an application that is literally distributed, still appears to run. Now, what's cap theorem? You can have any two. You can't have all three. Yep. You can always have either the right answer or be told, I'm not able to give you the right answer. Or you can always have an answer, but I'm not going to tell you, guarantee that that data is not stale. Or the limiting case, which sometimes people say, oh, it's not interesting. I think it's actually quite interesting. You can always have the most up-to-date value, and it will be correct. That's the limited case of a non-distributed application. Anyway. The whole point is, any two but not three. In other words, this is kind of satisfies Douglas Adams' original appeal in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. It's kind of a Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for the network. So how does this apply? You've seen this. You have two things, and there's a list with three things. I see this so often. It's just like, how did you write that? I'm going to blame micro front ends for a bit of it, but not completely. I'm seeing a list of three. The correct answer is three. There is no uncertainty here. Okay? You can't blame eventual consistency or the cap theorem, because the whole point, as, as I observed here, it's a feature of a distributed system. 
that it may not be in a consistent state, but it is a bug for something that can be consistent, the client to contradict itself. If on the very same screen you say one thing and another that contradicts it, that's on you. That has nothing to do with the network. So what I'm going to end with, technical debt is quantifiable as financial debt. Now, I'm not going to get into all the various metaphors that we can use for dealing with this stuff. I can, we can start back in 1980 with Maya Manny Lehman's observation, an evolving program is continually changed. Its complexity reflecting deteriorating structure increases unless work is done to maintain or reduce it. The point is that when he wrote this in 1980, the term legacy system had not been coined. We didn't start talking about legacy code until 1989 is the first recorded use of the term legacy. But people knew what it was. They just didn't have as much of it as we have now. In fact, it is longer from now to 1980 than it was from 1980 to the point where world wars didn't have numbers. Okay, just to give you a kind of sense of how far we've come in terms of knowing about this problem. A lot of people refer to the issue that they encounter as technical debt. I have issues with this. Um, what they're experiencing is unmanaged technical debt. There's a very precise way of looking at it. Technical debt is not intrinsically, like debt, is not intrinsically bad. They are dealing with technical debt. But actually, there's a bigger problem. People are focusing on the effect, not the cause. Technical, you don't get it by magic. Yeah, this doesn't happen by magic. It happens because of something. It happens either through conscious choice or it happens because of other pressures. Technical neglect is what leads to unmanaged technical debt. So you don't have an unmanaged technical debt problem. Well, you do, but it's a consequence. What is the cause? Ask what the cause is. Don't keep fixing effects. However, that's not what I'm going to talk about, even though I've just talked about it. Let's go back to where it got popularized. The term was taken from Ward Cunningham, who used the debt metaphor. He didn't use the precise wording of technical debt. He coined it in 1992. Throughout the 1990s, a few people would refer to this as technical debt or, soft, or software debt or quality debt or design debt. I tended to talk about it in terms of quality debt or design debt. But Martin kind of helped popularize this in the early 2000s. He's unfortunately updated his blog, um, which is a shame. He's revised it because this is actually a historically important thing because it actually caused people to become more aware of it. Technical debt is a wonderful metaphor developed by Ward Cunningham to help us think about this problem. Like a financial debt, the technical debt incurs interest payments, which come in the form of the extra effort that we have to do in future development because of the quick and dirty design choice. Right. Now, this is all well and good. Um, but the key thing here that's doing the work is the word metaphor. You need to understand what a metaphor is. A lot of people don't. So I found myself again cautioning against the category of treating the technical debt metaphor literally and numerically, converting code quality into a currency value on a dashboard. There are tools that will automatically produce bullshit for you. And not just chat GPT. <laughs> okay? There are tools that will tell you how much technical debt you have in your code, and they will put a currency value on it. This is as scientific as homeopathy. Okay? Except, at least with homeopathy, you get a nice glass of water out of it. This is complete, utter bullshit. Okay? This is not how it works at all. It's a metaphor. And so sometimes when I talk to people, they say, oh, yeah, 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 no, we're aware of that. And they talk about, oh, no, it's the cost of repaying the debt at this point. And sometimes they'll give you an hour estimate as to how long it takes. It's like, no, that's not what it is. Technical debt is not the cost of repaying the debt. It's the cost of owning the debt. That's different. It's not the same. That's the whole point. Because that was the implication. And I wrote on the implications of this a couple of years back on the O'Reilly Radar. That's the message of the technical debt metaphor. It is not simply a measure of the specific work needed to repay the debt. It's the additional time, effort, and all the past, present, and future work that comes from having the debt in the first place. And because you can't tell the future, you cannot quantify your technical debt. Okay, there's a, there's a very key point here. It's a metaphor you're not supposed to. It's a way of providing you with a vocabulary, a form of communication. It's not intended to be anything else. It's not intended to be taken literally. So, I'm going to give you a free one. That is impossible for me. 
seemingly. Thank you very much.